section of House Bill 333. We have some, we have some questions, and I think uh, Chairman Franklin's light was flashing first. No, we're not modifying anything that is not having a line under it or through it. I understand that convention. Okay. No, it's a it's a crime to possess firearms in certain situations and in certain locations, and if one is. That is a that is in current law as you read it. Representative Lunsford. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. At the appropriate time, if this committee see fit, I'd like to be recognized to make a motion. I don't mind doing that. Uh, I think Any Secretary Bearden had asked for that uh, privilege. Okay. Yes, sir. I'll defer to Representative Bearden. Any further questions of the author of House Bill 333? Any further questions? If not, the chair recognizes uh, Secretary Bearden. I just make a motion that House Bill 333 do pass. Motion by Secretary Bearden and seconded by Representative Lunsford to House Bill 333 be given a due pass recommendation. Um, is there any discussion on the motion? Any discussion on the motion? Hearing none, all in favor, please indicate by raising your right hands. All opposed? We'll send that on to the Rules Committee with a unanimous uh, favorable recommendation, Representative Starr. And let me say thank you to Mr. Chairman and all the members of this committee. We will expect you to be here at our next meeting to keep your perfect attendance record going. <laughs> thank you very much. Okay. Um, Representative Benfield. Uh, um, yeah, I just need We can. Okay. I will encourage those discussions. Um, I'm not sure yet, Representative, what our schedule will be next week, and that's due to things above this committee level, and I'm sure you understand what I'm talking about. But we will look to put it back on the calendar next week. Thank you very much. Uh, that brings us to House Resolution 413. The chair would recognize um, the secretary of this committee, uh, Representative Bearden. Mr. Chairman, before we get started, would it be okay if I brought up Phil Ken and Timothy sure. Schultz from two organizations to be with me? Okay. Tell you what we'll do. Just slide it on over. 
Why don't you introduce your uh, uh, colleagues to the members of the committee before you begin? Okay. To my right is Phil Kent. He'll be uh, helping us out from uh, Pro English. And to my left is Tim Schultz from uh, U.S. English. You forgot to mention that Mr. Kent is now also a noted author. And he signed a book for me a little while ago, so I was very uh, He hasn't signed one for the chairman yet. <laughs> I'll scratch my name out and put it on yours. So, uh, <laughs> <laughs> horrible oversight for the chairman. Uh, we, and, and we appreciate having both of you here with us today. Representative Bearden. Yeah, I've learned a long time ago that it's good to surround yourself by experts that's better than you when you're doing something. So uh, that's why I wanted them up there, and I appreciate them coming up and taking their time out of their busy schedule to testify today. And I appreciate the committee being here to listen to what we're trying to do here on House Resolution 413. House Resolution 413 is a constitutional amendment to make English the official language of Georgia. Currently in Georgia, you can, I'm sorry, right now in Georgia there is a bill that states that English is the official language, but it's a very weak bill. It allows county cities to do all types of other documents than any other language other than English. And what brought this to my attention was House Bill 21. That's a bill I did last year, and when it was in the other committee, we was getting a lot of phone calls from across the state. And we felt that was very important from listening to the phone calls, the emails, that we put this to the people of Georgia. We think it's very important to allow the citizens' voices to be heard. <clears throat> right now, across, this, across the nation, there are six other states that's made English the official language of their, uh, of their state. Alabama passed it in 1990. Arizona passed it in 2006 with well over 70% of the vote. California in 1986. Colorado in 88. Florida in 88. Hawaii in 78. <clears throat> What this does is protects the English language in our state. There are um, there's many things being done right now in our state. One is by the Department of Driver Services, where you can take a driver's exam in, I believe, 14 different languages. But yet, driving into the Capitol this morning, every street sign I saw was only in one language. We believe it's a public safety issue also to make sure all these signs are, or that with these signs being in English, that you take the test in English to make sure that you can read the signs and make sure it's safe to operate that motor vehicle. If you look at the bill, there are several things this bill does that promotes English, to allow English to be continue to be taught in other languages. I would point you to page two, line 14. From line 14 <clears throat> through about line 25, I believe, are all the, all the exceptions were put into the, into the uh, resolution to teach or encourage the learning of languages other than English, to protect the public health or safety, to teach English to those who are not fluent in the language, to comply with Federal Native American Language Act, the Federal Individuals with Disabilities Education Act, or any other federal law, to protect the rights of criminal defendants and victims of crime, to promote trade, commerce, and tourism, and to create or promote state agencies' mottos inscribed in public monuments. What we did, basically, we took the language pretty much from Arizona and incorporated it here in Georgia. And at the proper time, there was an um, incident in Alabama that we need to make one sentence change in this resolution and. I said at the proper time I asked for that to be accepted. I'm going to let, because this came up to, just came up to me, uh, I'm going to let Tim speak first and give you some information to why it's so important that English is the official language. It makes sure that people assimilate into our culture. I believe it was Roosevelt who said, we shouldn't have a hyphenated America. You're Americans when you become American citizens. And for over 200 years, there's always been just one common bond that held us together no matter where we came from. That's been the English language. It should be and it needs to be protected. 
But with that, I'm going to let Tim give some uh, information that has to do with when you learn. The more you learn English, the better you can take care of yourself. The more money you make. English is the language of business in the world. So with that, I'll turn that over to Tim for just a few minutes. Thank you, Representative Beard, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. Your last name again. Schultz. Thank you. As I said, um, my name is uh, Tim Schultz, uh, Director of Government Relations for U.S. English. Uh, we are a public policy organization uh, with 1.8 million members nationwide, including uh, more than 20,000 in the state of Georgia. And we were founded in 1983 uh, by then-Senator S.I. Hayakawa uh, of California, who was himself an immigrant. And today our chairman is Mauro Imuhika, who is uh, also an immigrant and a naturalized citizen from Chile, uh, and is also proud uh, that he is fluent in five languages. Um, I, like probably almost everyone in this room, uh, have a story that I can trace back to uh, my great-grandparents uh, coming to the United States as immigrants and learning the common language. And I think that's part of the reason why this issue uh, resonates uh, so much with so many people, because everybody has a family story, or most everybody has a family story that they can trace back and can trace to when they became an American and how integral learning English is in that process. Um, Today I want to really uh, talk and hopefully convince you of two facts, which I don't think are very controversial. The first is, is that Georgia is currently facing an unprecedented challenge uh, what, with respect to language that Georgia has never faced in its history. And second, I hope to convince you that the legislature has a role in dealing with and addressing this challenge. So let's first, let's just talk about what the challenge is. Uh, according to the U.S. Census, uh, their most recent numbers, in 1980, in the state of Georgia, there were about 44,000 people, who were residents of the state, who were what they called limited English proficient. That was in 1980. Today, just a generation later, the 2006 census numbers say there are more than half a million residents of the state of Georgia who are limited English proficient. Uh, that's a, a, a huge, obviously, an exponential change. Now, that is not by itself uh, necessarily a problem. But it does show that you have that there's a, a, a real uh, potential to have people unable to communicate with one another when so much of the citizenry is unable to communicate 500,000 versus 44,000. Uh, another very interesting statistic in the most recent census numbers is that uh, the, the census has a category that they call severely limited English proficient. That's folks who are extremely unable to communicate in English, not, not usually even a, more than a few words. Uh, relative to other states, uh, among the Vietnamese population of the state of Georgia. Georgia, among the Vietnamese population, has the second highest rate of severe limited English proficiency among Vietnamese immigrants. Also, Georgia has the second highest rate of severe limited English proficiency among Spanish-speaking residents, second only to North Carolina. So it's not just a matter of numbers. It's a matter of fact that the, that the challenge is definitely there, and it's, it's not necessarily getting better. It's, it's that the challenge grows bigger uh, the longer it goes unaddressed. Now, those are the numbers. And I, now I'd like to suggest that those numbers have consequences. Um, the first, I think, is just the, the consequences of social tension. I think all of us realize, uh, would, if we're completely honest, that part of the tension, the social tension with respect to immigration, is just the, the, in, the sort of inability to communicate with one another. That heightens whatever tensions already exist. If people can't communicate with one another, uh, that is not a good thing. It doesn't build bridges. But also, as Representative Bearden mentioned, um, they have severe economic consequences. I'm again, I'm quoting the census numbers again. Uh, according to the census, and we're talking just about the state of Georgia here, an immigrant who speaks English not at all, the median income for those immigrants is about $18,000 a year, $18,000. Uh, the median income for an individual who speaks English well is $29,000 a year. And the median income for individuals who speak English, and again, we're talking immigrants, immigrants who speak English very well is $41,000 per year. Now, citing those numbers, the Urban Institute, which is one of the, probably the foremost uh, researcher on, on poverty in the nation, and also hardly uh, a right-wing outfit, this is what they said about these numbers. They said, quote, for immigrants, poverty and the need for public benefits, such as food stamps, are more closely related to limited English proficiency than with citizenship or legal status. English, if you, want a, if you want an immigrant to succeed in the United States, this is the Urban Institute, English is the key to assimilation, both in becoming an American, 
but also in moving up the economic ladder and being self-sufficient, not, not needing to take advantage of, of public services. Now, since this is pretty obviously the case, we'd like everyone to learn English, I think we would all admit uh, that if, if the legislature could sort of wave a magic wand and transform, give everybody who currently lacks English proficiency suddenly to have the ability to speak English, it's something that you would certainly do. They, they wouldn't take, you wouldn't take away their native language, but you would add the ability to, to, to speak English as well. Unfortunately, we don't have magic wands uh, in public policy, but now I'd like to try to convince you that the legislature has a role in addressing the challenge uh, that the state currently faces. Um, again, as Representative Beard mentioned, uh, illegal immigration was something that the legislature has addressed. Um, not, we don't take a position on that at all, uh, but it is clear that it was something that people believed the legislature, if anybody in the state was going to have a say, it wasn't something that was just going to be outsourced to state agencies. It was definitely something that the leadership uh, was going to take a, take a lead on, that the elected representatives were, were going to take a leadership role in that. And I respectfully suggest that if that's the case, uh, no matter what, how you came down on that, if that's the case with, with immigration, it should also be the case when it comes to assimilation policy. How do we help us, the, the immigrants who are here assimilate? And if, as I mentioned, English is the key to assimilation. So again, it would be appropriate for the legislature to have a role in shaping assimilation policy for the state. Now, I suspect that the folks who will, uh, you'll also hear from me later today, uh, are going to quote to you some numbers that will suggest this is not really a matter uh, with which the legislature should be concerned. And one thing that they will almost certainly say is, is that there are some statistics that say that third generation immigrants in the United States today are learning English or becoming English dominant faster than ever. So we don't really have to worry about quote unquote protecting the language. Okay, that's the thing. And that's, and that's a legitimate thing to argue. However, my counter to that in advance is that if you all of a sudden heard that there were a sudden high rates or higher a spike in the number of high school dropouts in the state of Georgia, it would be of very little comfort to you if you were told, don't worry too much about this because the grandchildren of these high school dropouts are going to go to high school, they're going to complete high school. Don't worry too much about it. We don't have anything to worry about. We would realize that a, a spike in high school dropouts or any other a similar type, type situation would be a matter of immediate concern with immediate consequences, and it would be something for the legislature to immediately think about addressing. And I think the same thing is true here. It's, it's wonderful that the grandchildren of immigrants are learning English. It's, it's fantastic. And I think that's why we don't have to worry about the, the long-term viability of English as the common language. That's not something we have to worry about. What we have to worry about, though, is keeping our assimilation policy for the immigrants who are coming as first-generation immigrants helping them succeed in America and helping them become proud Americans uh, like so many generations before have. Um, I, I want to talk a little bit about, just, br just briefly, specifically about, uh, about this resolution. I think that this resolution strikes a proper balance. On one hand, it does require that legally binding government business be conducted in English, but as Representative Beard mentioned, it gives state agencies, they retain flexibility to use other languages in a host of situations where that makes sense. Um, and I think that it therefore would be quite incorrect to refer to this bill as an English only bill. Um, certainly nothing in the bill, nothing in the text of the bill suggests English only. Uh, not in government, certainly English most of the time, certainly English is a priority, but not English only. And I also think it would be a huge mistake for anybody to suggest that that's the kind of society we want to have. But we have not ever been, and I don't think we should ever become, a, an English-only society. We should not try to become that. But we also do not want to become an English-optional society. And the goal of policies like this is to, to make sure that immigrants still have the responsibility to learn English and that we do everything we can to encourage uh, that responsibility. Um, I, I think a, a pretty good analogy to this is the bipartisan welfare reforms that took place in the late 1990s, uh, one of the, the sort of after the fact, a lot of people look back on those from, from both parties and say these were, these were pretty successful. And part of the reason for that is, is because there was a transition away from uh, dependency and a transition to empowerment, uh, empowerment in place of dependency. Uh, Mayor Giuliani uh, had a, extreme success in New York with welfare to work programs. And he wrote uh, in one of his books that actually the cultural change that had to take place first was the cultural change that took place in government agencies. He said it used to be the case that government agencies would say, 
how can we best give you welfare benefits? That's our job. We want to give you welfare benefits. And he said that really you had to transition and change the culture of those agencies to say, how can we best help you find a job? So a lot of times these cultural changes away from dependency have to begin in government agencies. And again, that's something, that's guidance that has to really come from the legislature. Um, in closing, uh, I'll mention that the chairman of U.S. English, who I mentioned at the beginning, uh, Mauro Mutika, is a 40-year resident of the United States, uh, speaks English with an accent, but also speaks it among four additional languages. And he says that he's always annoyed whenever he walks into any government office, the automatic response when they see his last name is they automatically shove a form into him in, in Spanish. They assume he can't speak English. And he's, he's obviously insulted by this. And, and I think that if we are going to, maintain, to sort of continue as a nation of immigrants assimilating immigrants, it's just inappropriate to treat immigrants as mere customers to be served in whatever language that they happen to speak. Uh, we should see immigrants as the next generation of Americans, Americans in training, who are uh, capable of learning English, want to learn English, and we can help them learn English. And again, the <coughs> legislature has a role in encouraging that. Um, Representative Bearden's uh, resolution I think is in line with that public policy goal. It's also in line with the values of the people of Georgia, and I think that they should be given an opportunity to vote on it. Uh, and so I would uh, respectfully recommend that this committee uh, recommend this, this legislation uh, for a full vote and that the people uh, have that opportunity. And uh, I will take any questions that you may have. We'll stop now and do some questions. Let me ask you, uh, Mr. Schultz, I think it was 1998 that Georgia passed um, a statute Correct. dealing with this same subject matter. Yes, sir. Uh, tell me, if you would, why we need a constitutional amendment in light of the fact that we've now had this statute, which uh, is very, very similar in content, uh, for 10 years. I would say that the, the statute is, there are some similarities, but the statute really doesn't really get into prescribing the operations of state agencies. At really at all. And it, it has some nice things about the English language being the common language. But in terms of actual, real, specific guidance to state agencies, it, it really doesn't have that. And so I think that's, that's the reason. I think that a, a more precise policy, and again, we're talking about, um, you know, as you said, 98, so about a decade of experience. Uh, the state agencies are not necessarily, they're, they're not really, English is not really in practice the official language of the way state agencies operate because there's no prescriptive advice. They're kind of free to do whatever they want. And so I would say that's the reason. Okay, thank you. If I could dovetail too, Mr. Sure. Chairman, uh, over in Alabama, they do have a constitutional amendment mandating English as the official <laughs> language of government. And it was up, uh, upheld by the U.S. Supreme Court in 2001 by the Sandoval decision. And so that obviously is a, is a strengthening uh, Factor if you have a constitutional amendment, because in many other states, I think there's about 30 states now that have similar similar uh, official English statutes. But that is the strongest. Alabama's actually was upheld by the U.S. Supreme Court. And, and okay. I, I would also mention Representative Bearden uh, mentioned the Arizona uh, initiative ballot initiative passed in 2006, and that's very similar in language to this to this initiative. Um, it's telling that even though there were a lot of sky is falling <coughs> from some of the opponents of that initiative. There hasn't been a lawsuit uh, challenging the constitutionality of that most recent Arizona law that passed in 2006. That law is in effect. Uh, the sky hasn't fallen, and the predictions that many of the people, uh, many of the opponents made, which is almost identical bill, um, you know, haven't come true, um, and nor, nor has it been struck down as unconstitutional or anything like that. And also let me uh, add in, this does not affect private businesses, people in their private homes, or private conversations. But what does allow to happen is to allow government to take the lead and say it's time to make these changes. Because as uh, Mr. Schultz pointed out, the more English they learn, the more self-sufficient they will be. <coughs> being self-sufficient is truly the American dream, not being dependent on this government or federal government. That's not the American dream. That's almost like prison. So the more that we take the lead to push to make sure English is the language, the, 
the more they can help themselves and become more productive Americans in our society. Thank you. Uh, Representative Jacobs. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm going to be so much into your debt. Uh, yes. <laughs> I mean, I'm at least two inches taller. <laughs> Representative Stacy Abrams. I understand that. I understand that. Well, no, he was at one time. Um, I, I have a few questions, please. Um, first to Mr. Schultz. Um, you referenced the, the Urban Institute study, and I believe that study also indicates, if you can speak to this, it indicates that immigrants, particularly legal immigrants and refugees, learn English better and actually tend to improve their proficiency by learning it on the job as opposed to learning it um, through English-only classes. Can you speak to, do you, are you familiar with the, that provision in well, the study? I'm not, I, I don't, I haven't read the study in total in, in a couple, probably in about a year, but I, I could probably still speak to that. Okay. Um, and again, we're talking about, that, yeah, it's, it's definitely true that the job, the workplace, is a place that lots of immigrants learn English because, you know, a lot of employers want to encourage that facility, and, and, and rightly so, and I think we ought to encourage that. Mm -hmm. But I think that um, we're, not, we're not talking about sort of, that versus sort of English-only classes. I mean, this bill would very much keep in place. This 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 becomes law. That practice of businesses. I mean, there are a whole as a, not just businesses, but churches, community organizations, all of those uh, those organs that help promote English and teach English to immigrants still in effect. And, and we're, not, we're certainly not okay. advocating a sort of sink or swim mentality. So, so you would agree that, that on the job learning of English is important and a critical. Absolutely. But, important. Okay. Um, my second question then would be. Would you consider jobs to be the promotion of commerce? Because my concern is this language would prohibit most um, most immigrants who do not live in areas that are served by public public transit. It would prohibit them from actually getting a driver's license and legally being able to engage in the promotion of commerce and the travel to the jobs that would be necessary for them to integrate fully into our community. It would also more than likely force them onto the welfare rolls because these are not citizens who are prohibited by law. We're not talking about illegal immigrants. You're talking about legal immigrants and refugees who are here by law who have been validated by the federal government and they would under this law be captured and would be prohibited from seeking driver's licenses which would in most areas of, the, of, of Georgia prohibit them from being able to engage in the, the production of commerce and being able to get to their jobs. Can you speak to that please? With respect, I think that's something that, that public policy probably needs to think about, but I don't think that the commerce language in this in this particular legislation would be that would be interpreted or should be interpreted that expansively. So you don't believe that the commerce language should prohibit the ability to secure a driver's license? No, I I, I believe that the commerce language. In other words, Representative Bearden, uh, this the amendment that he was was talking about was that there's no specific mention of driver's licenses uh, in this. I mean, there's no specific mention in this the text as it is right now. And <coughs> I don't think that the commerce language that you reference would authorize the driver's license test. That is not authorizing language for the driver's license test to be done in, in multiple languages. I would not interpret it that way. Do you think it's pro it would prohibit <coughs> the issuance and the offerings? Because if you read this in conjunction with subsection 2, would you not agree that this language seems to prohibit the driver's licenses test to be offered in languages other than English? I think that this language does prevent that, yes. And so you don't believe that there's a contradiction between allowing the promotion of commerce in one section but prohibiting the execution of that promotion of commerce in a se separate section? I, I, I don't because commerce, and there's a whole bunch of Supreme Court cases on this, albeit in a different context, mm -hmm. of sort of how expansively commerce, I mean, you can always with, with kind of stack one inference upon another to kind of make anything a, a commercial act. You don't believe that that holding a job is considered one of the most basic notions of commerce? I, I do, but I also, I, I don't necessarily believe that a driver's license is a necessary precursor to holding a job. So transportation to that position would not be a precursor to holding the job? Transportation is, but that doesn't necessarily mean that a, that a driver's license for that person to drive is. I'm not, and again, I'm just talking as a legal matter. I'm really, I'm as am I. Yeah, and I'm unfortunately, I, I guess probably I'm, I'm putting on my lawyer hat a little too much here. Um, <coughs> Which is the hat yeah. I was looking for. I uh, appreciate that. Okay, no, that's okay. the hat I'm looking but for. But I, I don't think um, that, that if you're still talking about a legal interpretation, I don't believe that commerce is that elastic and expansive in definition. Okay. Because if, that, if, if, you, if you would take that construction of it, I think that you pretty much 
it, it becomes a gigantic exception that kind of swallows the rule because commerce, as the Supreme Court has again observed in, in other kind of other types of situations, just about anything with enough kind of inferential leaps can, can kind of be turned into a commercial activity. Just about anything is. And so okay. the act itself of the driver's license is not, I don't think, commercial activity. I mean, okay. it may be a precursor to many people's commercial activity, no doubt about it. But in and of itself, I don't think it's commercial activity. And I think that would be the legal, the probably the, that that would probably be what the attorney general's office would say as well. Thank you. Um, if I may ask one additional question, uh, Mr. Kent, you referenced the Sandoval decision, but I believe, um, if you can correct me, I believe the Sandoval decision was overturned on a question of standing that the court did not rule on the merits of the case from Alabama. Can you speak to that, please? You are right, and it's currently in litigation now, as you may know. In fact, my organization, Pro English actually has five plaintiffs that are still fighting in the Alabama court, so it, it has not ended yet. But my only reference to, to the chairman's question was uh, at least that constitutional amendment was uh, initially upheld in 2001, but you are correct, it's still in litigation. So just to clarify, when the Supreme Court upheld, what they did was overturn a lower court decision because they felt not that they, the merits of the, the case were valid, not that the challenge to the constitutionality was, was invalid, they overturned it because they believed that the person who brought the suit did not have standing to bring right. the suit. Right. Thank you. Right. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Representative uh, Abrams. Further questions from the committee? Further questions from the committee? Uh, did you want Mr. Kent to be heard from? I did. They probably signed up, but since I brought them up here with me, I didn't want to take away their time from testifying. So if you don't mind, Mr. Kent, testifying, sure. then I would greatly appreciate it. Mr. Chairman? Will there be a chance after other people testify? There are other people signed up, by the way, yes. Sure, yeah. These are the only the first two of uh, several. If they can stay with us, uh, I'm, I'm, I would ask them to, to be responsive to your questions. You need. To, now I've got a light blinking from a member who had earlier indicated a question. Do y'all wish to have further questions before we go to the next speaker? It's just procedural. Oh, okay. Uh, Representative Mangum. Uh, similar to the procedural issue that was just asked uh, about speaking with. The, I apologize. I had a minor emergency to come up, and I was not here for the first part. And have I missed a previous hearing on this particular bill? This bill was uh, heard last session. In subcommittee. All right, because I, I just didn't remember <coughs> hearing anything about it. And that's right. All. Okay, thank you. Okay. Uh, did you, you wish to have a question, Chairman Franklin? Yes, sir. Sure. Any 
Respectfully, uh, Representative Franklin, um, there have been a, a host of, of Supreme Court cases in recent years, the United States Supreme Court, about. Did they make law or did the legislature make mm -hmm. law? Well, I think everybody has a, has a duty to the Constitution, the courts, legisl you know, legislative branches, every, everyone does. But it's the preemption, it's the, the preemption doctrine. It's the idea of when, what happens when federal law. What article or section of the U.S. Constitution has that? Well, I mean, it's, it's based all the way back in you know, the line of the, the, the Marbury versus Madison case, the McCulloch v. Maryland case. Um, I mean, it goes all the way back to the founding <coughs> of the Republic. Now, uh, there are many who, who take issue with, with some of those uh, cases, which are pretty foundational to our legal system. But again, I, I, I would, would say, and, I, and I'm not even necessarily talking about what the right interpretation is so much as what the interpretation is, like what, sort of what the black letter law is. And at, at this point, and, and that is, is that when state law and federal law clearly conflict, that the, the, the federal law, the supremacy clause of the Constitution, the federal law trumps, and and there are federal statutes that have that that, that are make that make certain demands, make certain requirements of states, and states, um, you know, again, a whole line of, of, of pretty, you know, fundamental cases, and, and not just recent, even, I mean, not Warren Court decisions. We're talking all the way back to you know John Marshall. Um, have, have so held. And again, I'm, I'm not necessarily even taking a position on that, but it's, I, I guess I would just say that that, that would pretty, pretty probably be the answer that the Attorney General would give you as well. Well, well as you know, Representative Franklin, I agree a lot of times, and I think we think a lot on the Constitution. Mm -hmm. But sometimes when federal law <coughs> puts limits on states, which I don't think they should do, you know, I'm a state's rights person. I think we have the right in the state to do things and they shouldn't interfere with what we do, but sometimes they do. And when that happens, when we do certain bills or constitutional amendments to our constitution, we're just guided to be within those confines. I don't like it very much either. But to make sure it passes and make sure this up, it's upheld until we can get judges that interpret the constitution <coughs> and what it states and not what they want it to say, this is where we are. And this is why that language was put in there. I know that may not answer your question either, but I think you know that I agree with you that we must interpret the Constitution to what it says, not to what we think or what we want it to say. Mm -hmm. It was Absolutely. written pretty much plainly. Okay, and, and if I could ask a, uh, a couple more questions. On the same page, line 14, do you think we, uh, it would be a little bit clearer uh, if, if that uh, subsection C read the state and its political subdivisions may only use a language other than English for the following purposes. Where, where there's no uh, wiggle room that uh, any of these could also imply others. Jim? <laughs> well, that word's slipping now. I, I think those, those words will be the same. Yeah, I don't see any. Are you on page two? Page yes. two, lines 14 and 15. I, I don't see any. You don't see a difference in the language using one or the other? No, no pun intended. No. <laughs> I don't. I don't. Representative Levitas is way down the pecking order of a large number of committee members who want to ask questions. I think you're, you're number you're number three hundred and thirty six here. <laughs> Chairman Franklin. Commerce and tourism outside of the United States. 
You could add those words to clarify it. Thank you, Chairman Franklin. Now the chair is going to try to take these in the order in which they were lit up. Mr. Uh, Ken, if you'll bear with us, uh, the discussion of the Constitution has elicited a number of questions. Let me see if I, um, is this Representative Setzler, uh, represent, uh, Representative Benfield, do you have your light on? You're not next. Okay. Are, are you waving off? Okay. All right. I'm just trying to determine location. Um, Representative Setzler and then back to Representative Abrams. Did you have a? Okay. Representative Setzler. Um, I'm reading on, and I'll address this to the author and I, Obviously, the author, any of you are free to, any of you are free to uh, answer the question. Um, looking on page two, line seven, I want to understand, try to think through the, the implications of what line seven may suggest. <coughs> I read it to say, a person who speaks only English shall be eligible to participate in all programs, benefits, opportunities, including employment provided by the state or its political subdivisions. Uh, there's an exception for those who are required to speak another language is provided for obviously uh, specific requirements outlined below. Um, how are we going to establish, and this isn't a gotcha question, it's just, 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 an, just an honest question. How would we establish, quote, English speaking, unquote, that a person is an English speaker? Um, I know there's a lot of folks that kind of ambiguously speak English. They kind of speak it. Um, they may be conversant verbally, but not conversant in reading and writing. Um, I mean, would this lead to a, a, an English test for folks to get employment um, for a municipality or a or a government? Well, if you're a U.S. citizen, according to the oath, you're already proficient in English. So that's been a court guideline for a long time. Is is there a requirement to be a U.S. I, 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 I question. The citizenship it, test. Is there a requirement to be a U.S. citizen to work for a municipality or, or a political subdivision or, yeah, or the well, state? Well, there should be. I don't know when. The, this is one of the reasons, and maybe we can go into this, this is the reason why you're having the legislation to tighten up the loopholes in the official English law that we already have in the state. So remember, we do have an official English law already. This is an attempt by Representative Bearden, commendably, I think, to tighten some of those loopholes. We could go into that a little more. Okay. Uh, Representative Sessler, I think that um, I, I think that if part of it is just reading the whole paragraph. Okay. You know, kind of all together. It's definitely not establishing English as a foundation, you know, some sort of English literacy or whatever as a, as a, you know, as a statutory requirement right now for, for employment with the state. There may be other such requirements elsewhere in the state code or in state agency practice or regulations, but this is not establishing that. I think what this is doing is talking about, and that's why the, the word only English is important here, because we're talking about people who, who really don't have a capacity to communicate in any other language. They're just, they speak English and, they, and that's pretty much it. That they don't speak, you know, they don't speak Spanish as well. They don't speak Vietnamese as well. Their only okay. language that they're capable of, you know, of, of communicating in is English. Um, it's it's trying to say they cannot be discriminated against in employment for yes. that, um, you know, for that reason. Um, it's it's a non-discrimination clause is what it is. Um, and again, it, they're still you still can quote discriminate against them in employment because sometimes being able to speak another language is a bona fide job requirement for certain positions with the state. And those positions, of course, are some of those types of, of positions will involve the activities that are mentioned from subsection C and onward. But for people who are not engaging in those kinds of activities who are state employees, uh, you can't be discriminated against because you're you know, born in the United States and you were never lucky enough to learn another language. That's, that's, that's I think, what the provision is. And, and thank you here. I, the fifth time I read, I read this, it, it, 
in response to what you said. I, I do read it now as you're saying, a person who speaks only English shall be eligible. Um, and, Mr. Chairman, could I ask one other question while, I'm, um, while I've got the mic? Um, and this is a, probably a, a minor question, but I'm looking on page two, um, line three, no law, ordinance, decree, program, or policy of the state goes on, shall require that any language other than English shall be used for documents, regulation, orders, transactions, proceedings. Um, and this may, may not be the appropriate time to address it, but sign language, I don't know if sign language is, is considered a, a foreign language, but I can imagine a proceeding whereby if there were a deaf person that were, um, there, there could be a requirement to use sign language to communicate to folks. I don't know that that needs to be addressed here. But it's already used in, in courts, just like, for example, in Fulton County, there was a recent incident where uh, a divorce document was submitted in Spanish. Well, okay, but you still have to have the original court document in English. So if you're signing, you still have to get the uh, uh, a document in English because the purpose of this is to have English as the official <coughs> language of government. I believe that happened back in August because I had the uh, AJC report or article that came out of Okay. When they received it, they had no idea what to do with it. Right. They couldn't read it. So it needed to have a translation in English. So oh, I, I, the court. So I, 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 I understand your public policy objective, I think. I, I just I want to make sure and, we're crafting this. And the other, I think, the other thing that's a, that's a backup on this is that the, the ADL language, the, the, Ameri or the Americans with Disabilities, the ADA language, the, the Americans with Disabilities Act, I mean, when, when public meetings are, are signed or when public documents are signed, that is usually pursuant. I mean, yes, sometimes it's just because people want, because the, the agency wants to, but it, it pretty much is always relevant to the compliance with the Americans with Disabilities Act, the federal requirements that you provide reasonable access and so forth. So that's another, I would argue, probably good reason to have that language in there about the Americans with Disabilities Act, because that catches sign language uh, as it, that would be included in that sort of broad provision. Okay. I, I think you've answered more of my question than I, than I really asked. Okay. I, I, Sorry. I think my question was, could this, I mean, and, and I appreciate that, I mean, I, mean, I, I do, I, I guess my question is, is could sign language, could any provision or policy of a local government that said you're going to have sign language available at a public hearing, town hall meeting, again, this is a constitutional amendment, this isn't getting down into the details, I just want to make sure that that's addressed and doesn't, doesn't trip us up in some way. It, it's, it's a minor point, admittedly. Thank you. Did that, did that take care of you? Okay. Thank you, Representative Sessler. Um, Representative Levitas to be followed by Representative Abdul Salam. No, but uh, if a state center into a contract with someone or another group, then that would be in English. So if someone wants to have a private conversation, say, someone that can speak Spanish in their district and speaking to someone else in Spanish, that's fine. We're not, we're not trying to do anything on the private sector with this bill. But I said earlier, we're just trying to say the government's going to take the lead on this issue right here. And, and I had another question, and this is at least two things I think are by way of, of what I guess is a similar amendment. <coughs> Number uh, on the same page of lines 11 through 13, um, if the 
unlike and this this uh, Adam tells me is this a subparagraph or <coughs> some subparagraph number subparagraph number three and four have the qualifying language that say except is provided <coughs> in subsec subparagraph C of this paragraph. But subparagraph five does not, and I just wonder if you don't run the danger of five swallowing up the expect ex exceptions provided for in subparagraphs three and four. And I guess what I'm asking is would you be considered a friendly amendment after the word English, comma, except is provided in subparagraph C? Yeah, I do. You want to address it? Well, <laughs> I, I don't think I, I, I actually I don't think that that amendment would be necessary, but I don't think it would be a problematic either. Um, and the reason I don't think it would be actually literally necessary is because uh, I, I think that because those other provisions are more specific, uh, the general statutory construction rules, the sort of the more specific sort of trumps the more general, and the more specific, then I don't think that you could then have you could kind of say never mind with subsection five. I mean, that would not be the way a, a, a court uh, would interpret it. Right. But if, if, if you wanted it as a friendly amendment, I don't think it would do violence to this that's, at all. That's one. And this, this one, um, and I hate to diverge a little bit, but uh, really the housekeeping note here, I'm going to guess this is a former DA in me. Mm -hmm. On line 21, at that subparagraph number five, I would ask as a friendly amendment mm -hmm. to switch your order there and have the uh, victims of crimes uh, <coughs> No, I, I mean, I think we already have the victims of crime to tie on our priority list. Uh, and I know that it won't change the effect of the statute. Right. Um, but my final two questions. Um, on uh, page three, lines one and two, who is going to bear the cost of the prevailing, the person who prevails? In other words, the taxpayers of Georgia are going to have to bear that. Is it the individual person, uh, the business? I'm assuming it's completely geared towards official action. My would go is whoever is violating the law, if it's the state, county, or city, whoever is getting sued, you know, would be the ones that be. Again, if we all just clarify that that's what what's intended, so there's no question that the master of the bill make sure that we say state funds all come out of the treasury of the state. My final question, and this one does trouble me a little bit. I may be misreading it. This is um, subparagraph G. I hope I'm getting this right, Madam Council. Line 7 and 8. When it says nothing in this paragraph shall be interpreted as conflicting with the law of the United States, the way I read that is that you're directing the court to be directed to not have an interpretation of this law, of this, this provision, that would conflict with federal law. Um, because as it reads, nothing in this paragraph shall be interpreted as conflicting with the laws of the United States. Seems to me to say that you can't read this as being in conflict with federal law. I don't. I don't think that it's. I think it's more of kind of the, the canon of, of avoidance. Uh, it, you know, it's one of the one of the doctrines of statutory interpretation is when you have a potential collision between the federal law, federal constitution, and then a state law or whatever. When you have one that would clearly trump another, okay. And if there's two different interpretations that are both plausible of, of the language that you want to take the interpretation that doesn't cause a, confl a conflict between the two. Um, I mean, it's pretty clear from the other more specific language elsewhere with the Americans with Disabilities Act and so forth that there is an effort here to, to, to say, hey, we're not, we know that we're, we can't conflict with federal law. So this is more just kind of a kind of a catch-all, repeating again, we know we can't conflict with federal law here, but also it's kind of an encouragement in case a court would not want to use that canon uh, that is, it's an important canon. I think it helps protect the state from, you know, more legal fees and, and more parts of laws being struck down. And also rise above it in uh, paragraph F, mm -hmm. stating that part of this should be in ballot by a court of competent jurisdiction to arrest it until state in flux. So, uh, right. And I, I, again, that's, I, I really guess I'm pointing this out as something that I think may be mindful of as a potential conflict. If, if your intention is to Make sure that we're not interpreting in a way that's intended to. Because if there's a, if there's a choice between conflict and no conflict, you may want to say that. Uh, but again, as, as I read this, it seems to be directed towards interpreting the paragraph. I think I know the chairman well. This is my last bill in front of this committee this year, isn't it? 
I think I've just asked my last question. Thank you. <laughs> Representative Abdul Salam. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, gentlemen, for being here today. Um, actually, uh, I thought I was going to get the answer to my first question that Representative Levitas touched on, uh, and I had a specific question as to the Federal HAVA Act, the Help America Vote Act, which specifically speaks to uh, allowing people to register to vote and have forms and stuff in the election process in their native languages. Um, will that be in direct conflict with this law? Well, I think <laughs> well, it, it, it does not affect uh, what that happens under the Voting Rights Act. Okay. So when jurisdictions do trigger multilingual ballots, uh, this doesn't address that. Okay. Um, Follow-up question. Um, in reading through the bill, um, I don't see uh, reference to penalties for agencies or, or state uh, bodies that may violate this is there anything that will trigger penalties and if so what will those penalties be the standing right to sue would be the, uh, yeah. the penalty if they are violating the law then someone would have the right to sue it would be just like you were it. it'd be just like if you were violating the um, open records or meetings act um, anyone could sue you well actually i think if i'm not mistaken the secretary of state could actually take action as well so uh, is there any attorney general or the yeah. attorney general yeah right. so I in that instance but in this one I don't see well, well this one here I'm trying to find but it does tell you about the attorney general even if he does not take action to stop it then the person has the right that answer your question Perfect. I have one more mr. chairman if it's all right um, will this um, constitutional amendment have any effect on I guess funding uh, for ESOL classes in our public school systems. No, no effect. It won't tr trigger Absolutely. to take them out. Just exempt it completely. Okay, thank you. Representative Mangum and then Representative um, Abrams, is that, or Benfield? Which light? Benfield. And then Chairman Knox. May I allow Representative Benfield to go before me? Chairman. I'm going to come back around to you. Representative Benfield. Thank you. Uh, this question was prompted by some of Representative Levitt's question. This made me think, I, I see uh, Representative Pedro Moran here, he's fluent in Spanish. If he gives a legislative uh, update to the Hispanic Chamber of Commerce in Spanish, would he be violating this if this were passed? No, it's, it's not a government. It's, it's, this is the official language of government. As a chamber of commerce speech, you could speak in 135 different languages if you wanted to. That, did that answer? My, my counsel to the left can define it as well. <laughs> <laughs> oh, would, he, would he be allowed to offer a resolution in Spanish in the Georgia General Assembly honoring the Hispanic Chamber of Commerce? It would still have to have an official English. Document. He could do it in 130 different languages, but ultimately it would have to be done in English. There would have to be an official version of it in English. Yeah. And then I have some questions about uh, page one. You used the word proficiency a couple times, promoting proficiency, proficiency in English and other languages should be encouraged. Do you have any specific plans to, well, first of all, what is proficiency in English? Is there a, a legal definition of, of what you consider to be proficient? Graduate from Georgia Tech, that might be one benchmark. But <laughs> the University of Georgia. It's a much, 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 much better gauge. Yeah. Is that question still on the floor? As to the first question about how you define proficiency, I mean, proficiency just means to promote the acquisition of greater knowledge of, and I think that's the dictionary definition, and that would be the, the definition that, that courts would use. But again, it's it's just talking about that the overall, it's, it's more a mention of what the overall whole of the statute is. It's not something, a word that has to be, that we have to draw a precise line at what point one has achieved proficiency. Um, so I don't, I don't think that, that you need or that, that would be necessary in this statute 
to have a kind of a clear definition of what point you are, quote, proficient. I think it's more just a, it's more a statement of what the aspirations of the statute are. As to your uh, question about what we're, what you're doing to promote uh, <coughs> English proficiency by the statute, I think, again, uh, what I said in my testimony about how you really want to infuse every government agency with the notion that English is something that has to be promoted. If it's the official language, it's not our job to try to see as to try to do operations in as many languages as we possibly can. Our goal is to try to promote English acquisition. And if you change the culture or if you encourage that kind of culture in government agencies that, that, are, that are meeting immigrants, uh, then I think that that in itself promotes English acquisition. There are other parts of Georgia law that do it as well, English as a second language programs and so forth that are already on the books that this doesn't touch. But as far as this act specifically, I think it's more just about the culture of government, what, what government promotes and doesn't promote. I'll take care. Okay. Um, Chairman Knox and then Chairman Franklin. Mr. Chairman, uh, I have a motion. That I'm not sure if this is in order to make this motion or not. I'll tell you what my motion is, and then you can. I'm sure you'll let me know whether it's in order or not. I will. Due to the length of the debate on the bill and seeing that there seem to be some issues that we might need to address, I'd like to make a motion that we defer consideration to a date certain, further consideration to a date certain. <laughs> All right, we have that motion. Here's what I'm going to do. Um, there, the chair has always attempted to accommodate member questions, and I have two members that have questions. Uh, I'm at least going to deal with those two questions, and then I'll come back around to your motion. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Chairman Franklin. Yeah, uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I'd like to just address this to uh, Mr. Schultz. Uh, you brought up Marbury versus Madison and uh, got a quote from that uh, where they talk about a proposition that the Constitution controls any language any legislative act repugnant to it it also says a law repugnant to the Constitution is void and that even the courts are bound by that instrument and um, so I think because of that, in our oath of office, we do have the authority to, ter to determine uh, what has been reserved to us, and uh, I would hope you would concur with that, based on the plain language of Marbury versus Madison I and the Constitution. I definitely agree with Marbury versus Madison. Great. Thank you. Representative Abrams. Um, I just have two additional questions. Uh, one. You've cited other states that have put this law into place. My concern is that Georgia is one of the top-ranked states for refugee resettlement, and particularly we are attracting women who come from oppressive nations. Uh, it would strike me that, and if you could speak to this, that this would chill the ability of those women to seek independence if you prohibit them from accessing the accoutrements of, of, proficiency, of self sufficiency, such as having a driver's license or seeking court orders, which may not necessarily speak to a public health or safety issue. But for example, if they were to seek a divorce decree but have not achieved English proficiency, which is actually considered um, expertness, it is not simply knowing the language. Under the rule, under the, a very plain reading of this language, they would be prohibited from seeking a court decree because they would not be able to. I, I see shaking heads, but let me finish. Sure. Um, the two issues I have are that oppression is not, by definition in the U.S., considered an act of public health or safety. How would these women, who are the vast majority of the refugees who are currently resettling in Georgia, how would they be able to access the levers of government or access the levers of commerce if they're not allowed to access driver's licenses or to access the court system in some fashion um, if this language takes effect? Well, as we mentioned earlier, the Fulton County case, you had uh, a Spanish couple filing for divorce in Spanish, uh, okay, but you still have to have the document then translated into English, and that's the point again of official English is your government language. A refugee or a sponsor of a refugee family can, can file a divorce degree in any language whatsoever, and then it's translated into English as the official document, so that's not a problem. That there are two parts to my question, but I, just to stick to that point, subsection th 3 says no law, ordinance, decree, program, or policy of the state uh, or any of its political subdivisions shall require the use of any language other than English for any documents, regulations, orders, transactions, proceedings, meetings, programs, or publications. 
that's any that does not simply that does not say only the official final recordings it says that you cannot require this would mean that if there were programs or publications that were to be produced in let's say Tanglet for refugees this would prohibit a subdivision from issuing that requiring the issuance of those documents in that language would it not I actually I actually think that the answer to that question is yes unless it fell into one of the exceptions so yes it would prohibit for example providing information about how to obtain a divorce decree for a Muslim woman who is seeking to divorce herself from her husband under Georgia law unless it fell within one of the but if it is not if she cannot fall within one of the exceptions I would say that the publication would not be so the oppression of women could be continued because they would not have access to information under the terms of this law but this is where I would respectfully disagree okay because remember there are 118 languages according to the census spoken in Georgia obviously the state of Georgia is not functioning sort of doing official business right now in all of those languages however and many of these languages that refugees speak and you're correct absolutely correct a lot of a lot of refugees in Georgia and speaking many languages but Georgia is not currently conducting official business in the languages of the refugees for the most part not for the most part now there may be some cases where they are but definitely not across the board so the question is how do they get access to government how do they how do they now are they being turned away now and I think that respectfully the answer is no because the way that they deal with the way they access government is the way they access if they go to a hardware store and they can't speak English okay the hardware store is probably not going to have a translator they're probably not going to have a pamphlet they're going to take a friend they're going to take a family member they're going to take a sponsor and they're going to get their business done but that doesn't mean that that doesn't mean that the hardware store is somehow discriminating against them if they don't have the pamphlet for them and neither was the government and frankly that's what Georgia is doing right now and Georgia is not operating in officially in the languages I would I would completely agree with that the state of Georgia is not however the county of DeKalb issues link issues decrees issues programs issues publications and multiple languages because we are one of the top counties receiving refugees for resettlement along with Gwinnett County Fulton County and Cobb County my concern is that this language does not simply prohibit the state of Georgia it prohibits any political subdivision which would by necessity mean that DeKalb County Gwinnett County the city of Atlanta would be by law by constitutional law prohibited from providing that information and in fact they could not require that any of their divisions provide that information including information accessing the court system my second question however was about access to driver's licenses because this would have the same application for women who are seeking to achieve driver's licenses and typically if and again I would like for you to speak to other states who have this experience women who come from oppressive nations usually cannot access the levers of government other they typically have to do it themselves they do not have a sponsor who can help them and to the extent they seek to see they seek outside employment they would need to have the ability to travel that travel would be usually facilitated by driver's license under the reading of this law they would not be allowed to take sit for a driver's license exam until they had achieved proficiency in the language although they were legally in the United States and therefore they would be trapped in the relationships that they're in until such time as they're able to learn English which they likely would not be able to learn because they're in an oppressive relationship can you speak to that please can I make a couple quick points number one with all due respect if if you're not for assimilation of refugees and legal citizens you won't like this bill it is designed for assimilation of people into our American society point one point two let's well actually if we can stick with point one what I don't understand what the question what that point you want refugees in DeKalb County who are here legally to assimilate absolutely by being be allowed to so so can you speak to me about how asking that they be allowed particularly women who are typically prohibited from accessing these opportunities by prohibiting by further restricting them to these homes where they are isolated because you're not allowing them to access the driver's license how is that count contrary to wanting them to assimilate well you saw all of the tools in this bill of the urging of English proficiency in many ways that English is a second language being an excellent tool that I how are they going to access it if they cannot drive to the places they need to be well DeKalb County has some wonderful services having lived there but go ahead and representative I think as far as the driver's license thing I remember there's an there's an right now I think this bill is pretty ambiguous about how it affects the driver's license that's why this amendment and again that it's that's a different but I think that this I don't think that this bill or this this resolution specifically prohibits or specifically allows it it's ambiguous right now so I don't I think that we don't have quite 
quite an answer yet on this bill on, on, on the drivers. But on the other thing that you mentioned, and you were talking about women who are trapped in violent relationships. Or not, not violent, oppressive. There's a difference because violence would be covered by your public safety exception. Okay. Oppression is not exact, is not considered a violation of civil rights under Georgia law correct, currently. So not your, so your husband. Give me a specific example. For example, that. under I, under many Muslim cunt cultures, women are not allowed to have jobs outside the, and not to say Muslim cultures, under some practices under Muslim religious law, mm -hmm. women are not allowed to have jobs outside of the home. Okay. Therefore, if they come from, if they are they are in their homes, they will often not be allowed to have the keys to the house. Mm -hmm. They will not be allowed to own a car. They will not be allowed to get access to those to those levers. What this would prohibit, for example, there are refugee organizations that allow these women to come live with them. They take these women in and they help them get access to 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 driver's licenses so that they can travel. Under this bill, those refugees who are legal here who can proficiently drive a car much in the way illiterates can drive a car without necessarily being able to read every single sign, these women who may have the technical proficiency but may not have the literacy to read a sign or to, to sit for an exam in English would be prohibited from taking a driver's, a driver's license exam. And I find that to be problematic and having a chilling effect on the attempt by these very worthy organizations to stop the oppression of women. Let me, I think we need to explore more the driver's license issue because you are right. It, currently it's ambiguous, although I would argue, and I think Representative Bearden and others seek to amend the, uh, the section more specifically, and I'll read you the language with your permission, Probably. Representative Bearden, on what, what you're going to offer. Um, it would be no law, ordinance, decree, program, or policy of this state or any of its political subdivisions including but not limited to the Department of Driver Services Administration or driver's license examinations for all classes of licenses shall use any language other than English for any documents, regulations, orders, directly what you are concerned about. Mm -hmm. And over in Alabama, to give an example, which again, my organization Pro-English, some of its members have sued the Department of Public Safety over in Alabama for a point that's very controversial, probably one of the most controversial aspects of this. And that is the whole overriding factor of public safety. You mentioned our signs. They're obviously all in English in the state of Georgia. Should we, like the state of Alabama and other states, be giving driver's license tests in various foreign languages, including over in Alabama, uh, Farsi, uh, Chinese, uh, Arabic? Uh, this would say no. This would say you have to give your driver's license examination in the state of Georgia only in English, and again, to foster the assimilation that is the, uh, the point and, of the bill. And I think Representative Abrams, that's the amendment that he's referring that to. That is the amendment. The, 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 the resolution right. that, we, that we're discussing, I don't think it necessarily does that. I think it would take you to vote. You right. have to approve both this and also the amendment in order for that driver's license thing to happen. Well, uh, Mr. Chairman, with your um, permission, I, I have this actually opens a whole new line of questioning for me, so I will hold that until we take a vote on the, um, the motion to, to defer, if you'd like. If we do. Okay. I can continue asking questions, but I can hold off. If if you, I don't mind you going ahead okay. with the questions, if you'd like. I would like. Um, so going to that issue, City of Atlanta, um, DeKalb County, Fulton County, Gwinnett County, these are all counties that are actively seeking. And in fact, I think today we announced there was a Korean company that was coming to Georgia that was bringing jobs. Under an English-only requirement for access to a driver's license, those CEOs would not be allowed in those counties, and I, and I would take Atlanta City, I would take the City of Atlanta, DeKalb County, Fulton County out. If you locate in any county that is not ac accessible by MARTA, you would not be allowed now. Well, but foreign license is honored here in Georgia all the time. That's not a problem. But we do not, to the extent that these, these people decide they are permanently here and choose to assimilate I, I, I suppose actually I would ask you a reverse question. Well, I would, I would actually, CEO, the foreign I, I, which is why I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to alter my question. Do we have any data to support that there, there's an, there's been an increase in drivers' license ac or drivers' accidents based on non-English speaking holders, as compared to those who have licenses in Georgia who are compared to those who are proficient English speakers? Do we have a higher incident rate? Alabama. Now, in Alabama and Georgia. I don't have any in Georgia. If you would like to hear what's I, going on in our neighboring I, I would, states. I, I, would, I would respectfully disagree that Alabama and Georgia are similar situated states. Okay, but they do have a public safety problem and more accidents are on the rise, according to Alabama. But I have nothing to 
that I, I would, to the extent that you can provide the information and provide data on Alabama's increased um, access, the number of new immigrants who've moved into Alabama, because I would argue respectfully that Alabama and Georgia are very separately situated when it comes to encouraging international relocation. Yeah. And I would suggest that the, the, with the absence and the provision of data, yeah. you, the threshold issue is one that changes changes fundamentally the constitution of the state of Georgia. Um, and to the chairman's point, we have a bill, we have a law. This is not a bill. We have a law on the books that supports the proficiency and supports assimilation, which I'm very, I'm very much a, a, a proponent of. I believe the assimilation certainly is, is necessary, but my, my concern is the extent to which you prohibit and limit political subdivisions such as the city of Atlanta, such as DeKalb County, which are actively encouraging other nations to send their their dollars to the state. The extent to which you, I, I would I would argue that Alabama is not analogous to Georgia in the extent that we are doing our best to encourage that international assimilation, that international relocation, and because we are standing as a, as a location for refugees and for legal immigrants. I, I'm, my concern is that those comparatives are not exactly, as a threshold issue, um, synonymous. I've got a couple comments I'd like to make, if I could, just briefly. Do you think your citizens that you represent would be safer if everyone knew how to read street signs going down the road and they understood what the sign meant? Or do you think it's fine that people just take tests in many different languages? I, I believe that most of the citizens who, that I, in fact, I would say all the citizens I represent would encourage safety, but I do not believe that every citizen I represent is literate, and literacy is different than proficiency. There are those, I, I grew up in southern Mississippi, and I will tell you that the ability to read the driver's license test has nothing to do with your ability to read a curve, a curved arrow on a street sign and know which way to turn, which is why we have directional signs as opposed to simply English language signs. The reason we put pictures with our words is that we recognize that there are those who may not be proficient in the English language, but who are proficient in understanding what signs mean, which is why Americans are allowed to take, to drive in foreign countries, and to Mr. Kent's point, why we honor foreign licenses when folks come to the United States. It is not a function of whether or not a person is proficient in driving, it's whether or not they are allowed to take a test in a different language. That usually speaks to a public policy issue of whether or not you want to spend tax dollars to write a test in a different language. It is not a question of whether or not they're actually able to drive a car effectively, which is also the reason NAFTA per permitted, although we've never actually fully executed it, we were going to permit foreign drivers from Mexico to drive in the United States because we did not believe that you had to be able to read English to be able to follow street signs. And so I don't think that that's actually an appropriate question. I'd not say appropriate, but certainly I, I don't think that that question speaks to my lack of willingness to have protective protections for my DeKalb County voters. I would have to disagree after 15 years of law enforcement and trying to communicate with people that could not communicate the dangers that are out there for the law enforcement officers and the community. I just disagree with, and I respectfully disagree agree with that. But Would just, just briefly, I mean, we got 11 pages of county or countries that have official languages. When you go to um, English, United Kingdom, Australia, Bahamas, a list of them. The United States is not listed. Well, I just feel like this is trying to take a turn that it was never designed to turn, Mr. Chairman. It's not anti-anything. What we're trying to do is to assist in assimilation to our country, our culture, the laws that we have on the book, for people to understand that we, we're not going to have or we should not allow to have states within side states like they did in, did in France and everything just burns down. Where, where countries cannot communicate, law enforcement cannot go into certain areas because they cannot communicate. That's not what this has turned into, but that's what it's trying to be twisted to. We want to assimilation into our country. 
We welcome immigrants, and we have since we have become a country. We, we've always welcomed them. But just like in uh, the U.K., where Jack Smith, the Home Secretary, stated, those who we welcome into the U.K. to work and settle here need to understand our traditions and feel that they are part of our shared national culture. They need to integrate into our country, learn English, and use our language. All this, I know we're probably about to move this to defer because it has gone much longer than I ever anticipated. What we're saying is over 80% of the people across this country <coughs> wants this government and the national government to make a stand on English. What we're, what we're wanting to do is allow the citizens of this state to allow their voices to be heard. That's it. I just get, got a little bit upset because it feels like it's trying to be twisted in something that's totally not. And I just want to make clear that's not the case of this resolution. I know you made a motion. I know it was seconded. And at this time, I would support that motion. But um, I, just hearing all this time, I just want to make sure that was clear. This would give the citizens of our state a chance to have their voices heard. And uh, well, you've made the, the you, 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 you've made the chair's decision much easier. Um, we still have lights, but I think what I had said earlier was I was going to recognize those that were flashing at the time Chairman Knox made his motion. Um, Mr. Kent, will you be able to join back with us when we reconvene? Will you be able to join with us when we, when we reconvene? I don't know what date that will be. Um, uh, there was a motion made. The author has no objection. Is there any objection to, um, and I've got two members that want to ask questions. Do you all wish to ask those today or when we reconvene? Okay, waved off, okay. All right. Um, any objection to the Knox motion? If not, uh, we are, uh, and I'm not sure what date we're going to do this, but we're going to put this on a date. We say, uh, wait just a minute for the members of the committee. I've got some subcommittee assignments. We're going to put this on a day on which there will be no other legislation to be dealt with other than um, Representative Bearden's resolution. We may even do a special meeting date. So, uh, but we'll get notices out to you on that. Um, I've got two subcommittee updates to give you. Um, First of all, um, I'm assigning House Bill 983 by Representative Collins to the Mumford Subcommittee. I am moving Senate Bill 276 from the Mumford Subcommittee to the Knox Subcommittee. Um, and uh, I know now that we're getting a few bills in each of the subcommittees, they will be meeting. Um, I know there's some discussion about the General Assembly schedule early in the week, so uh, we'll have to adjust accordingly. Uh, I'm not sure when we will meet next. I know we will meet at least next Wednesday. Any questions from the committee to come before? Oh, um, we will, for those of you who were here today and signed up to speak, uh, and I know there were a number of you, we will maintain the sign-up sheet until we come back to House Resolution 413, and you will be given priority over any others who may add their name in the interim or on that date. So with that, uh, anything from the members of the committee? We're adjourned.